It's not that the economy around bookkeeping will go away or the economy around gyms like Planet Fitness will go away. So those things will still be part of the economy. The question is, how are you going to deliver value? There's going to be value delivered in that commoditized world. It's just going to be more challenging to create value in that world as a commodity offering. Brian O'Rourke. Good to see you, my friend. Rick. How are you? Thanks for making time, man. Of course. Hey, I want to do Did You Know, but I want to make sure that if, in case people have been living under a rock, yeah. there may be people listening, I know this is hard to believe, who don't know who you are. I would say that should be you first, <laughs> me second. I don't think so. So for anyway, like, listen, uh, you've done a lot of amazing things and are still doing them. So can you just tell our listeners, like... Well, about so, yourself. God, I hate talking about myself. I mean, so, you really do? Yeah, I'm just I really so uncomfortable. Do. I just love I really watching you squirm. I'm like, Brian's, a, Brian's an amazing guy. Tell us how amazing you are. And he just about wants to drop under the desk. Brian K. Rourke with a Y. Google it. There right. you go. That, <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a background in, in finance, and I uh, worked in the food business for a long time uh, with a very well-known entrepreneur before his passing, Al Copeland, who's the founder of Popeye's. And we owned a lot of different things he did. Then I worked as his uh, chief financial officer, did that for years, and then Got into technology and then in the fitness space and, and franchising. I grew a number of well-known global brands. Smoothie King Franchises is an example, which we were stakeholders in and others. Um, and then got involved in fitness in uh, toward the late 90s and have done a lot of things in that space. Um, you know, in the last seven years, I've closed 19 M&A transactions in the space. And we own 14 operating companies around the world. So from a chain of health clubs in Bangkok we're involved in, all the way to, uh, you know, other businesses like Vertimax. And then, of course, we uh, are proud to assist Alloy in its uh, growth yeah, trajectory. I'm, I'm, every time I uh, dig into your background, I always wonder how I have you sitting at this desk right now, because... I don't know how you do it, man. You're so busy and you have so much going oh. on and you're in high demand. And yeah. look, it's uh, you're the only guy I know who can just post a picture on LinkedIn and get like 500 likes and everyone's <laughs> like, oh, Brian, I'm so glad you're doing well. I mean, you just you're just that dude, man. And I think it, it's a testament like to me, um, you know, through my lens, you're just a guy who's super giving, who helps a lot of people. And obviously with your knowledge that you have opportunities to do a lot of that, but you really take your opportunities and do good with them. Does that make sense? Oh, I'd, I'd like to think that. I mean, yeah. but you're, you're the same way. So, um, you know, we've known each other for a while now. Yeah, 20 years or so, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like almost that long. We sat on the ACE uh, advisory That's where deal. We officially met. Yeah, and then yeah. you were working on the alloy stuff years starting ago, and I watched you through that, and now you're That's franchising. Right. So uh, Brian always gives me the creeps a little bit because I know he knows where I'm going, but he's very uh, gracious and nice, and so I can say, hey, this is what I'm thinking, and I just get this weird Brian smile. I'm like, <laughs> what he's like no i mean it's that's good man that's that's hey man go for it i'm like no brian tell me he's like ah you're like nah it's not. i'm like tell me i'm shaking him by his lapels you know speaking of lapels he's also the sharpest dresser right now, i so i didn't wear go. my best suit today but i tried to be a little summary for you, you always look good man. always looking sharp so well also like i mean just for your did you start the fit tech council or are you just the president of it or is that like what yeah, you, it was started by Intel actually okay, with a it. group of folks, and it originally was designed as Fitness Industry Technology Council to create standards. And very soon after I was put in that position, uh, I figured out that that wasn't going to happen. So what we've done instead is kind of pr promote our mission is promoting the thoughtful adoption of technology. Ooh, I like that. And thoughtful being the operative term. I was about to say, I Sorry. like that terminology. No, that's perfect. I love it. <laughs> so thoughtful. Because, and then you were on the yeah. URSA board for a minute. Yes, I was there for five years during yep. the COVID uh, thing. And Man, we, good time to have you on the board. brought Liz Clark time. in as yep. CEO, and she's been great and um, made great colleagues and friends in that in that group. So. Gosh, I can't even think of all the other things. I know you left out a lot, but listen, just look, I mean, hook up with Brian on LinkedIn, anywhere on social media. He's also really good at marketing, which sounds really weird because he has an MBA in finance, but I don't know. I don't, this guy's just something else. He's pretty much good at everything. So anyway, I hate to, to, to pull you out of your intellectual mind and all of these gifts that you have. Let's do Did You Know. So what okay. do you have for me, Brian? So did you know that for every 74 guys in the United States that graduate with an undergraduate degree, 100 women today are graduating with an undergraduate degree. And it gets worse into graduate school as far as the disparity goes. That's an interesting fact. I have heard that. What Do you have any idea why that is? Like, why do you think that is? It's a very con – it's a big question. I'm not sure I know all the whys, but um, – 
you know, there's a lot to consider and unpack there. Um, but certainly things are changing when it comes to, uh, to uh, those dynamics where men used to graduate with degrees far, uh, at far greater numbers than women. And that has absolutely changed. I hear it from girls that I know that are sort of late 20s, early 30s. There's this weird mismatch, if you will, of um, sometimes employment, income, earning potential, educational. There's a gap between that age group, between the males and females, right? Yep. And it's interesting because that causes all sort of cascading effects with dating. Yes. You know, I mean, you feel like you, if you're not intellectually matched with someone, if you're not professionally matched with them, um, you know, financially, whatever that may be, it, it's just different and it yeah. causes issues, right? So I don't know. I don't know what to say about that long term. Um, but yeah, I think if you're an old guy and you want to date young girls, it's a pretty good sign. You know, you're probably going to, you're probably going <laughs> to. Well, let's say gender roles are changing in, in, in many respects, right. and we see it with the decline of birth of ch- children globally, the yep. effect of that. Uh, women, you know, entering leadership in the workforce of greater numbers. There's still a ways to go there, yep. but you can see what's happening. But we're talking yeah. about that top, top echelon. Yeah. Everyone's always like, oh, you've got – you know, look at Elon Musk or look at right. Bezos or whatever. I'm like, look, man, that substrata of individuals is so small, but just below that layer, it is much more equal than it's been. Yes. Right. And will yes. continue to be so. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. So. Yeah. Well, mine's not nearly as thoughtful. I don't know I do about like that. It, so. I can't okay. wait to hear. <laughs> it's so dumb. So there's a doctor, Dr. Donald Unger conducted a 60 year experiment. Now that's, that's commitment. That's data, right? To prove that his mother was wrong about arthritis from knuckle cracking. <laughs> Every day, he cracked the knuckles in only his left hand for 60 years. Can you imagine the commitment to this? Now, that is a ditch in uh, like none other. other. And so (laughs) after 60 years, he had not developed arthritis in his left hand. It was no different than the right. So if you ever wondered, cracking your knuckles, did your mama tell you that cracking your knuckles will give you arthritis? (laughs) The answer is no. And you can thank Dr. Unger for 60 years of knuckle cracking. Thank you, Dr. Unger. Yeah, thank you very much. So, (laughs) all right, without further ado, um, I really had a hard time and I was really really trying to to nail Brian down to a topic and it's like he's a, he's a smart guy and I mean he's read you know he super well read things that I find fascinating and love to talk to him about it we'll go to dinner tonight and I'll pick his brain for hours on end but he does have some um I would say levels of expertise he speaks all over the world he's a sought after keynote speaker and I think that you are I guess the word would be futurist I know that's kind of a loose term I don't know what that means I don't know if you like that or not but Really, like if you want somebody who can relevantly take a peek at what's going on now and what's going to, what it's going to mean, and nobody can predict the future, but I think Brian does a really good job of extrapolating data and saying, okay, based on where we're headed, this is what I can see, at least in the foreseeable future, right? Next few years, we're here. Maybe it ends up there, and then he can adjust as he goes. So I just want to ask you questions today, just probably just topics overall and just start conversation, if that's okay. Yeah, I'd love that. So we were talking offline a little bit before we started just about the economy. And, you know, everyone is a fatalist these days, certainly around the economy. Yes. And you're very bullish on the U.S. economy, especially. So I just want to hear your thoughts on that, why you feel that way and and what your lens is. Well, the United States, as we've seen in the recent past, uh, I think in the last 18 months, the Fed has taken rates up 11 times. Uh, There were a lot of uh, very worried people hand-wringing going on around uh, a recession. Uh, and the recessions never come. The United States uh, behind uh, Saudi, which is a much smaller economy, relatively speaking, has had the ro- ro- most robust economy in the world in the last several years. We've outperformed all of our peers uh, when it comes to GDP growth. Um, and there's a lot that's going right. Obviously, there's some systemic issues, but there's a lot that's going right. I wrote about this a couple of years ago in the post uh uh, the post-COVID economy and what we saw happen back at the end of World War I with the Spanish flu um, uh, pandemic. Um, and we had a roaring 20s that happened. And I really think that we're here right now. I think that um, the economy is just outperformed and I think it's going to continue to do very, very well. Uh, because of immigration and some other factors, our population declined because the slower birth rate really hasn't been as uh, extreme and as contrary a lot of to countries. popular belief, because I think that just the general common line of thinking is like, oh, it's too many people, it's stressing the system. But the real facts are you need population, like yes. a declining population is a real risk. Yes, we look at China, right? Yes. They have a massively fast declining population that's a huge risk for their economy and for that's their right. country overall, right? That's right. And you have to have young people coming up to you know stoke demand and create the next and also become earners to help older people that are, you know, getting to the end of their careers, et cetera. So 
It's very important to the economy. Also, the, the thing about the United States is we're energy independent and we're food independent, which are really critical dynamics right. when you look at a world that's uh, uh, deleveraging outsourcing uh, mm -hmm. as a result of supply chain challenges. Um, and we still are the leading educator in the world on most, uh, on most fronts in, in STEM. So uh, there's a lot that's really good about the U.S. economy, and it's um, been highly under, underestimated. And now, why do you think that is? Because did, have you read, uh, is it Steven Pinker's book? Yes. It's basically all the stats yeah. on like everything in the world is infinitely better than it's ever been. Yes. Yet, if you just listen to mainstream media, the yeah. whole thing's going to hell in a handbag. We're on fire, yes. right? Yes. But it's not the reality of it. So, yeah. and, and why do you think maybe specifically just the U.S.? I mean, is there is there a political angle to make it seem worse than it is? Is it just the way we're wired to to be attracted to salacious negative headlines? I mean, why are we? Why would we underreport the success of the economy? Well, that that's a sense? big that's a big question. Um, if you look back in history, in the United States, w there was always contention between different factions of right. people. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's always been that way. One of, being a federation like we are and having, um, you know, the discourse we have is all part of our history. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, I think, uh, think that recent happenings are or some anomaly. Yeah, right, they're, yeah, right, yeah. And, they're, and they're not. No. Uh, the, the question is, do our, ins our institutions strong enough to navigate those things? And, um, you know, I think the American people generally are fairly optimistic. We're a highly diverse population. Um, uh, we have a lot of great uh, things to rely on, like a um, a solid judiciary, you know, real uh, rule of law being enforced, all these things. We're the global currency and uh, we control the sea lanes. So, so, you know, there's a lot that's good about it right. uh, for us. And um, I think it's just going to be a very good run for the next five to six years. You know, we'll have some glitches here and there, but I'm very bullish uh, on the U.S. economy in general. I think in the business you're in, especially, um, you know, with what Alloy's doing, there's just going to be a tremendous amount of growth. Our our estimations in the last year for uh, economy uh, growth in uh, wellness services is going to be 6% annual compounded growth rate. Nice. Yeah, which means the industry will double in about 10 years. Yeah, and I don't want to get ahead of us because I have another point. Yeah. I think in that more tech, tech side, like what does that human-to-human -human experience look like? Right? Yes. I think that's going to be big. So, yeah. so U.S. economy doing well. Is there any other economies globally that you see – um, from your lens that are not doing as well, that have made some mistakes that are leading to less than stellar performance that are maybe being underreported? I mean, yeah. what's your what's your view outside the U.S.? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, we, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, sure. but um, I think that uh, China is really not nearly, China has huge problems. I mean, right. we all have problems. They have huge problems. Um, um, and, and they're, they're going to be dealing with a lot of things in the coming years. Um, Germany is is really dealing with a lot of challenges right now, um, and with those those countries and those significant economies, uh, they don't they're not energy independent. <laughs> they're not they can't grow their own food supply. Uh, they they so they they're facing uh, some some challenges, um, um, and those are some great economies. So we'll we'll see we'll see what the net right. net is in the years to come. Do you enjoy spending time just? looking at patterns and and putting these thoughts together do you enjoy that oh yeah i, I, I do get the enjoy impression it. that you do oh That's i why. love it i yeah. love it yeah i love it um especially you know I, i'm not you know they're historians so i'll read a lot of people's right. thinking yep. like you do i think and so you try to get a perspective it doesn't mean you're always right but it helps you at least in my situation interpret things in a way that i uh, maybe make it a little more digestible <laughs> right. yeah, yeah exactly. cuz it's a crazy crazy and i world. appreciate that that's why i like to hang out with you and get the cliff notes for <laughs> sure <laughs> cuz i'm not going to read the quran and all the other religious <laughs> teachings yeah, and, and, shots. yeah yeah i'm not going to read yeah, that either not, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but i would like you to read it and summarize it for me so thank you very much so all right so bullish on the us economy which is obviously great news for everyone mm -hmm. and um, i tend to agree it's just really hard to sift through it all unless you're going to sit and maybe your seat is like an economist and an mba in finance and really understand what you're looking at it's really easy to be swayed by negative headlines yes. and again the infighting that happens amongst political parties and that type of thing yeah so look i mean you're head of the fitness technology council uh, i love the idea you know some of the terminology used obviously ai is a big deal right now yeah. whether it be chat gpt which is just really a language app right at yep. the end of the day but still, like, where do you see, at least in the foreseeable future, five to 10 years, maybe that may be too far out because it's moving fast. 
Where do you see AI fitting into, let's just say, overall society to start with, mm-hmm. right? Or technology. They can bundle those together if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Well, first thing, I think that, uh, as you know, if you, you look around, there's something called the hype cycle. And um, you know, it's this curve that does this. And um, it goes through phases where there's this heightened sense of expectation. A lot of people talk about it. It's all they're talking about, like self-driving cars a few years back. Right. And then it kind of peaks, and then there's a trough of disillusionment. That's going to come for AI. Um, and then you get to a plateau of productivity where you're actually adopting these things and using them in real cases. Now, you know, not that chat GPT-4 and its iterations to come aren't very interesting tools that are doing a lot of cool things, uh, but it's certainly not the, the exploration of what is ultimately going to be general AI. Uh, right. These are large learning you know, language models, right. and uh, they, they have their problems. <laughs> right. you know, and if you've used Siri for a while or any of these different types of tools, they don't work half the time. Right. So that doesn't make it bad, but I think we get a little hyped up about things that don't necessarily deserve the hype yet. And, right. and it's really, I think, us being mindful of, well, how could we use these things? But uh, so, you know, I think it's a very interesting technology. You know, being an older guy, uh, I, I can think back to the 80s where this was a thing then. You know, you had people right. doing things. So, um, you know, but in the larger sense of it, um, it's certainly the idea of taking data and having machines and processing power, being able to do more and more things uh, more effectively is really going to be the bottom line to what this right. is, right? Now, do you think, um, because I think, at least for me, I think the early disruption, even from like a chat GPT or some of the early AI, it's been surprising because yeah. you would think it would happen at the manufacturing level, yeah. assembly line, yeah. you know, again, the automated driving, so truck drivers, like these are the things that will be disruptive, but we're not really seeing that. So not what yet. do you see like like right now is the the areas that are maybe most at risk from the current AI yeah. offerings? Well, to get back to, before I get into the current areas at risk, you know, uh, Amazon wouldn't be able to execute its uh, warehouse delivery distribution system without the robots it uses to do what it does. So right. there are there are implications of this stuff when it comes to manufacturing or other more mundane type tasks. But but the big thing for what's going to happen in a matter of time, and it could be four to eight years, could be a little faster, could be a little slower, is uh, is knowledge workers. And this is where I think you're going to see disruption, just like you saw it in the agricultural economy mm-hmm. of several hundred years ago before automation occurred. You know, a pretty large percentage of the world was employed in working in fields. Um, and that changed. Now, a, a, around 1% of the world mm. is working in that right. dynamic. And of course, what replaced that was a knowledge economy, an information economy. Um, and so we got computers and accountants and lawyers and all the, you know, service models around that became a big component of economics. So, uh, and now we're making another shift. And, um, uh, you know, it's been written about that there is going to become what's going to be termed a useless class. And that's going to be a number of people who are bookkeepers or other types of professionals doing things that machines will replace. And so the question is, what's the next wave? I think the next wave is is experiences. It's um, uh, the experience economy has been a dynamic um, uh, for a while. It's been written about for a while. I think technology will come in and impact the experience economy as well. But I think it's for what it is, that's a little further out. And so I think that What's going to become valuable increasingly is real human interaction. Isn't that strange, right? Like yeah. the technology would would create the need for more human interaction. You see that even – well, you wrote a, probably the best piece and the most well-read piece, at least in our industry, about what was going on with Peloton mm-hmm. and the – Per, you know, Peloton purchasing an equipment manufacturer that's in our industry and just sort of what that meant, maybe the valuation of the stock. And it was all very temporary based on, you know, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just a really well thought out piece. And it's sort of some of that was about where we are now, which is what you're saying, human to human, right? Correct. And so when you say experience economy, like, give me some examples, like mm-hmm. 
what type of experience is like, it probably covers a vast array of industries, services or whatnot, but do you have any examples that you can think of? Yeah. And before I get into some of those examples, let me clarify, um, you know, so it's not, what we're talking about is commoditization of fundamental mm. things. So yep. it's not that, uh, the economy around bookkeeping will go away or the economy around gyms like planet fitness will go away because right. it's a highly commoditized offering really. Right. So those things will still be part of the economy. The question is, how are you going to deliver value? Like, cause there's, there's going to be value delivered in that commoditized world. Uh, it's just going to be more challenging to create value in that world as a commodity offering. Right. So when you're looking at a value, that idea is, well, I'm going to put two and two together. It's going to mean five, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so that I can define that context first before I get into it. Um, you know, you can see it with travel right now. You know, I mean, you can do commoditized travel or you can do highly curated travel. Right. You're going on a trip and right. you're just talking about experiences, for example, uh, that you can go on Airbnb and buy experiences right. with people right on the line. And they take you around to, uh, you know, curated food experiences in Italy where you're going. Or these are the value people are going to be willing to pay for those types of things is going to go up right. as, as services become more commoditized. The same with pretty much in fitness, the same the same dynamic. Not that you won't have tools to help you do what you need to do, right. uh, you know, your, your apps or whatever, but people are going to pay a premium for human interaction because as a lot of their other life interactions become commoditized and highly convenient, they're just happening in the background. That is not going to really uh, be uh, seen as, a, as much of as a value add as these things that we're describing. I mean, that's, that's really interesting. And, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that in some ways, because, you know, one of the questions that we'll often get in the franchise is like, listen, what type of technology, like, are you considering AI? What type of iterations are you looking at? And of course, the answer is always yes, right? Everyone considering all things, but the final lens is, will these things enhance the human to human experience? If not, no. Yeah. I mean, our name says personal training. It's like, it can't be more experiential than that, at least human to human, right? That's right. And at least we're not in a spot yet where like AI, where the rock pops up in your mirror and he's talking to you as a friend and trains you, right? right. And looks at your form and makes right. you feel like you have a friend. It's like, we're not there yet. Yep. And until we're there, any technology has to pass the final lens. Is this going to enhance the human to human connection or is it going to replace it or diminish it? Right. That's, and that's, that's, right. that's sort of our final lens. And, and that's a very smart lens to have. It was like with Fitzy, the Fitness Industry Technology Council, we moved away from standards to helping people think through exactly what you're describing. I love it, man. I it's thoughtful it. adoption. Right. You know, not, right. not let's jump on the hype cycle and do this because we can say we're doing it right. when it's not really having a real impact on what value you're really delivering in the context of the user experience you're trying to create. Why do you think we we go there, like just the the humans in general, like we fall in love with like gadgets and things, yep. right? And so people, and you've seen this in the industry, they fall in love with the thought of like an AI widget that can do this in place of, or, yeah. and then they build all these things and, and there is some complexity there and I'm not even sure why it's built because when you, when you, when you zoom out and you look at it from say crop duster height, it's just a bunch of things yeah. that, you know, create actually more complication, but we fall in love with the things, yes. right? And, and I'm sure at, in that, in that role with the fit tech council, it's like, you probably see a million things and people are so excited about them. Right. But when you really look at them through the lens that you're talking about, it might even work against you in so many ways, right? Yes. To help you build a brand or a business. That's right. But what do you think it is about us? Is I guess it's just human nature, or what is it about us that gets us so excited about these new tech widgets and these little things, right? Yes. That we want to deploy all of them in our business when in fact it could be hurting us. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a couple of things. You know, there are many factors, but I think a big, <laughs> a big thing is that when we went into the information economy, you know, we're pretty much into after World War II, and we really grew our economy that way. What became highly valued was uh, analytical thinking, Mm. efficiencies, all these things that were very much about the information economy and creating value in that dynamic. Mm. So I think that people are just applying that, you know, I knew this, I learned this, so I'm going to extrapolate this way. So if you can show me a tool that does this thing five times better, that's what I want. Faster, less people, Correct. more efficient, Correct. less expensive, whatever those things that's are. That's right. right. And, and, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily the litmus test anymore as, as far as when you talk about commoditization. Because when you're competing against machines and that's your, that's your strategy, you're going to lose. 
Like you're, you're not going to be able to create right. value. Right. And so I think people are just enamored with that because it's been part of our recent kind of past, our ethos, yep. you know, in developed countries, et cetera. And a lot less attention has been paid to emotion, in, emotional intelligence, uh, empathy, understanding. Uh, we were talking about the plasticity of your brain and right. your mind. Right, I was about to say, like, let's talk about yeah. that a little bit, if you don't mind going no, there. No, because it's very linear. Because that's the way we're, like, yeah. through, through the lens of what you're saying, that's the way we're going to need to think to navigate this next phase of technology. That's right. Relevantly. That's Do you right. agree? That's right. I think that is it. Because if you're going to become part of the commoditization monster, then you're really not doing anything to you know, create value. Um, and so you have to rethink. And as Toffler brought up in his uh, books, Future Shock, if no, anyone knows who Alvin Toffler is, The Third Wave, he was very popular in his day. And he talked about the people that are really going to succeed in the coming years are going to be people that can unlearn to relearn. And that's very hard to do. Because as creatures, we're survivalists. We want to survive. And so if it's worked for us in the past, we want to stick to yes. what we know. Right. It's very hard to change your perspective. And as we're into an era of hyperchange, it's so much is changing externally uh, for people in many realms. Um, human beings tend to hold on even tighter to what they've known versus saying, I need to rethink this because, as Einstein said, if you bring the same level of thinking uh, to, to solve a problem that that thinking created, you're not going to solve the problem. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's a whole paradigm shift for everyone. Then. And, and yeah. unfortunately, the people that are seemingly at the top of their fields all are there with this certain line of thinking. Yes. And it'll be interesting as they are disrupted because, you know, the, if the very thing that's next is it is diametrically opposed to what you are or, or your success journey to get there, you're going to fight it tooth and nail, even yeah. if you don't consciously think you're doing it. That, right? That's correct. So there's going to be an interesting little friction there. And you're going to see this whole new line of like leaders emerge that have a whole different paradigm of thinking. Do you agree? I agree. I think that, and I think you're seeing it, but, you know, the Netflix parable, people always talk about that story right. and they're failing, but it's NASA with SpaceX, it's Mercedes and Tesla, it's, it's uh, Google and, and open, you know, chat GPT, open AI. It's the, the innovator's dilemma uh, that we're right. referring to. Yeah. It's still very strong and present. And, right. it, um, and you know, you got to break some things. You got to break your kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do. It can be done, but it's hard to do. Yeah, no kidding. Well, love it. Um, let's bring it home a little bit. So, yeah. fitness industry—that's yeah. obviously us. You're obviously well versed and yeah. in, in involved and in, invested in the fitness yes. industry. How does some of the the technology pieces, even some of the global economy, like what do you see next five years or so would be the future of the fitness industry? Yeah, well, I think you know more holistic. You know, it's not right. just about fitness, right? It's nutrition, sleep, yes. you know, all these components, right, for a better life, uh, higher quality of life. There's huge demand for these services. They're not going away. They're going to become more profound uh, in what people expect from them or seek out from them. As you know, we, we really don't have a lot of integrative uh, solutions around yes. that. Yeah. If you're part of the sick care system, as you know, you you know, anybody out there, they know, yeah, right. even with the best doctors, they're really not integrated into solving for people's health. You know, you're either getting a, a guy or a gal writing you scripts for meds, they're taking certain tests, a lot of those tests are inadequate in their depth. Um, and then there's an inadequate amount of service and help for people to see what they can do preventatively in many ways. Right. Um, well, that's um, not the business model. That's right. That doesn't right. pay to be preventative. Correct. Right. It doesn't. And if you've been to a doctor recently, you'd know that. Um, and so I think there's a huge subset of demand, and I think it's just going to continue to grow. Especially. Do you think it'll be fractionalized? Because obviously, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it through my lens as a franchisor. Like, I'm glad to hear you say that, because I often describe what we do, like, like what's the best seat to be in if you're going to be in the fitness business? And I'm air quoting, it's like, well, if you could envision a wheel, there's a hub in the middle, and the spokes are all these components that you talked about, right? Yeah. And so you can have nutrition, supplementation, recovery, sleep, mental health, stress management, all the things, right? And we all understand that like eating well and exercise, this is a huge portion of all these things, right? Yes. But if you, if you can envision yourself sitting in the hub in the middle of the wheel and helping to pull all these resources into someone's life. So yes. it's like 
this wheel is a human being, right? And you're in the hub, you're their core. And then you're going to pull in all of these other resources for this person, for this point in time, this is what they need, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got the resources to pull all those things in. At least for, for where I sit, for the foreseeable future, that would be the best seat to be in because that's the integrative approach that you're talking about. And you don't have to have all of the things. Like what I'm not saying is, you know, uh, oh, have a brick and mortar concept that's got all of these 15, 16 things. I really haven't seen that work. But if you can sit in the advisor role, if you will, in the middle and you can pull in those resources to help people, mm-hmm. great. Because there are like, in the, at least in the franchise space, there are people fractionally doing different parts and pieces this Mm -hmm. hormone replacement great okay that's one thing but that's one thing right and then you've got cold tub and you've got all the things around it right but they're all sort of splintered do you see a room for a like an all-encompassing concept like what's your idea on like what so i'm gonna open a wellness model i just want to help people i want to get people to a healthier place like i'm gonna open a business brick and mortar or virtual like is there a place where you can aggregately pull all this stuff together or are you best off just choosing a channel and, and sticking with it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, the answer to that question lies into what we just described about commoditization versus value add, right? right? Yep. And it's th- those things will be pursued in different ways and different combinations. What I do know is the greatest business models in this regard haven't been invented yet. Um, and there's no doubt because that always is the way it is. But if you were to ask the question, where would you like to be placed? That is where you'd like to be placed. Whatever right. you want to label it or however you want to spin it. And whether it's Diamandis' concept that they've rolled out and it's more medically oriented, but mm-hmm. uh, it's certainly far more primary prevention. Or if it's Blue Move, uh, uh, Blue Zones uh, right. thing they're opening in Miami, yep. um, you know, th- th- those, given the p- different proclivities of those models, the the bottom line is, is that demand for those services in that manner you're describing is really the ultimate growth market, right. from, in my opinion. Right. In any way, shape, or form yeah, that and, you can get your toe yeah, in correct. that water, That's you should right. do it. Yeah. That's right. And you, you look at – and look, there will be fitness models like Planet, you know, they service, but that's that's a commoditization play. Yep. Um, and, and good for them. They'll service a market. Yeah, Someone's got to be there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. But if you're going to compete and you're going to add value, I'd rather be in another position for the long run. Yeah. We often talk about that. Like there's obviously just take fitness and there's ends, two ends of the spectrum. It's like you can be like to your point on the commoditized end and what are you going to do your memberships for eight bucks because they do 10. I mean, like what are we doing? Right. right. There's there's not much to do down there. But then I would it just seems easier maybe the way that I'm wired to be on the other end of the spectrum and just provide a a very personalized concierge level of experience. Yeah pull some of these wellness things in people are going to pay a premium for this yeah exactly and it's just a better place to be because you can you can take fewer people that you can actually affect change with run a good business model and and at least in your small corner of the world you can actually make a pretty decent change right it's just a different different model altogether I, i agree and i think that's going to be as i said i'm very bullish on that market there'll be interesting things like alloy that's emerging growing very well congratulations appreciate that um uh and some others that that keep going into that vein. And I think those concepts are going to be the ones that are going to see superior returns, uh, a, a premium paid for their delivery of service, because that's what people are going to seek. Yep. Yeah. I often joke like, you know, we, we're we slowly but surely, and this is actually coming from franchisees, which is good, is our, our base price keeps creeping up because yep. we've got tiered pricing. But we've got bold, really smart franchisees who are like, man, we could sell this all day long because they see the value in it. And lo and behold, that that trickles down to the team and it goes to the community and they're selling it, you know, tier four when they might have been in a tier three market. Right. So we're sort of helping them along and, you know, coercing the ones or, you know, sort of like motivating the others to kind of move along and increase their rates. But I think um, in doing so, I don't know, it maybe just speaks even better to this particular group. And it's going to allow us to continue just to put more juice into the exact same thing you know, exactly what you've said. Like, what else can we put around this service that put keeps us in that hub seat, if that yep. makes sense? No, it does right. to me. And bifurcation of the market has been going on for a while in consumers' markets. I think it's just going to continue to do this, where commoditization is going to be clearly commoditization. And people, you know, might use that for any number of purposes. But the profit and sustainability and the real value chain is going to be at, at the other well, side. I, think it's some, I mean, even if you take boutique fitness, Brian, mm-hmm. you already see that a little bit. Like if you're in the 20 people getting sweaty market, there's yeah. a lot of other people there. There's a bit yep. of a commoditization. There, oh, right? big time. See, Orange Theory is still about 20% off brand wide coming out of COVID. Correct. It's like, there's a lot of other stuff that gets you sweaty with 25 people. Right? Correct. 
where you, you know, and then now there's the birth again of all the recovery franchises and all the kind of things, that, you know, in that regard. But it's just going to be interesting to see. So I don't know. I like the seat we're in, and I'm glad that you see it the same way. But um, I do. I, I think it's a good seat to be in. I appreciate that. Well, listen, everyone, I could take more of his time, but I'm pretty sure he's got to go do some world changing phone calls and, and some other things. But no. anyway, it is, it's an honor, honestly. Listen, I, you've I, done I a great job with your podcast, friend. man. I mean, I, I, I watch it. Of course, our team works well, on it. This will help me a lot because it was, it's been up to this point, my mom and one of my cousins. So I think we can add another family member as a viewer by having Brian O'Rourke on. But ladies and gentlemen, Brian O'Rourke, appreciate you, Thanks, my friend. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate you spending time, brother. Thanks. Good to see you.